We want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to this fall campaign. We are happy to report that, thanks to your generosity, we exceeded our $50,000 goal. Thank you. We know you rely on this site regularly, and we're grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. We are so grateful for all of you who chose to become or to increase your monthly contribution as Working Preacher Sustainers. We truly appreciate your commitment to support this ministry monthly. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And uh, this podcast is for November 6th, 2022. Uh, we are jumping from 1 Kings to 2 Kings. So uh, last week, if you remember, we uh, were introduced to Solomon uh, and particularly the story about Solomon becoming king after his father, David, and then asking for, of all things, wisdom instead of fame or riches or long life, he asks for wisdom uh, and then uh, delivers a wise judgment uh, for the two women who are who are arguing over whose child um, uh, the, the living child is. Now we're in Second Kings, uh, chapter five. We're uh, we in the narrative lectionary. Uh, we're skipping over Elijah, but we're going to his disciple, his his successor, Elisha. Elisha, and we have the famous story of Elisha healing Naaman, who's a Syrian, uh, a foreigner and a, a, a general, a, a military leader in Syria. <laughs> Uh, and he has leprosy, and he comes uh, to visit Elisha. Now, what we've skipped over, of course, is that um, that after Solomon's death uh, the, in 922 BCE, the kingdom splits in two. The southern kingdom uh, goes with uh, David's uh, dynasty, with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and, uh, and his descendants. And the northern kingdom has a succession of kings, uh, one of the most notorious uh, being Ahab, and uh, uh, that's Elijah is kind of the antagonist for Ahab. Uh, Elisha, though uh, uh, Ahab doesn't appear here, Elisha is, again, uh, the successor to Elijah. And he, as Cameron Howard says in, our, uh, in the, uh, the written piece, the essay on this text, Elisha is more a person of deeds than of words, you might say, or, or the text is more concerned about what he does than what he says. So Elisha is a prophet, like the prophets that we'll be talking about in the coming weeks. Um, but the the uh, the stories about Elisha are, uh, there are more stories, more narratives about Elisha than there are his preaching or his oracles. And so this is uh, a miracle that Elisha does not for an Israelite, but for a foreigner, Naaman. When you contrast it with, when you contrast this story with uh, the story of Elijah doing a miracle for a foreigner, it's really interesting. Um, the in the story of uh, of how he first feeds the widow uh, of Zarephath and then uh, raises her son, he is the he goes to her. He leaves Israel to go to foreign land, and he is the he is the guest of her hospitality. Here, it's the complete opposite. Um, uh, a, a young girl who is a captive; uh, she's been taken captive uh, from Israel in, uh, in war. Uh, she is in the court of, of uh, Naaman, and she says, "Hey, there's a prophet uh, down in Israel." And so I think that's the first, I mean, just us. And he has to go to Eli Shah, who won't even come out to see him, you know, which is a yeah, fantastic mm -hmm. thing. But especially that detail of it's this, uh, as so often in the Old Testament narrative, it is a uh, person of no social standing, uh, someone who's been taken slave in war, who is the godly one who knows um, where salvation might be found. It's a tremendous contrast, uh, indeed. Uh, so Naaman is the um, successful warrior 
who has this debilitating disease. Um, and his approach upon finding out of this healer is to go in all of the statue and status that he has and uh, or that he assumes. And um, uh, it, it's a, that in itself is a contrast to the, the very one who, who said, oh, by the way, there is a healer. Um, uh, let me point, point him out to you. And so it makes the offense of not of Elisha not coming out to him even more marked in the way this text is presented because he goes in all of his statue and um, the offering to him for healing is very simple, <laughs> offensively simple. Yeah, and the and the you know what Elisha tells him to do right, wash in the Jordan seven times. First, he doesn't even come out to see him, which is of course. Uh, offensive, but then to wash in this, you know, little river of the Jordan, uh, you know, this muddy river, um, Naaman almost let almost forfeits his healing because of his pride, right? He is so self-important. He is, and he is an important man, obviously, in uh, in his country. But uh, he's he's willing to let pride stand in the way of his uh, of his healing. And again, it's. Uh, you know, it's the unnamed uh, servants who persuade him otherwise, right? In verse 13 of Second Kings 5, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, his servants said, um, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So it's the, the, the slave girl, the Israelite slave girl, and the, the servants who um, see what the great man, uh, the great general can't see. Uh, this, I just want to say a, a, a word about this text. Uh, so I have, in in teaching um, some of my international students, particularly uh, African students, but also uh, South American and Asian students, the question often comes out, how do you tell a true prophet from a false prophet? Mm -hmm. Which is not you know, not something that most mainline Protestant churches have to deal with, right? Uh, not too many people claim to be prophets, but that is an issue uh, in much of the global South and in somewhat in North America as well. So who's a true prophet? Who's a false prophet? I remember I first was asked this question when I taught in Ethiopia and my Ethiopian students were very interested in that. And one thing that this story tells me at least this is how I interpret it, is that a true prophet like Elisha is not in it for personal gain or certainly not riches or monetary gain because, you know, Naaman comes with these extravagant gifts, right? 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 talents of silver, 10 sets of garments. And Elisha rejects them. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't want them. So... You know, one thing this tells me is that unlike many self-proclaimed prophets in the global south, um, yeah, monetary gain is not the is not the issue and is not the goal. No, I should say I think there are true prophets as well, uh, even today. But um, there's too many self-proclaimed prophets who are in it for their own uh, for their own wealth. Uh, they want to become wealthy. Our leaders, the celebrity status uh, That's true. to which. Um, Naaman is actually appealing to. Um, and uh, as you've noted, Catherine, uh, Elisha's, you know, I'm, I'll do this. It's simple. And I don't need all of your promises, gifts, um, accolades. And I'm not going to make a spectacle of this. It's very much the opposite of what those who like the status that our culture offers. Mm -hmm. And so in that act, to answer the question, what is a true, true prophet? Um, the text begins to reveal not just the pride that was preventing uh, Naaman or was potentially pre preventing Naaman from being healed, but the pride that potentially prevents a true prophet from actually bearing witness to the presence and power of God. Because if I'm doing it, if I'm doing it for show, if I'm doing it for mm -hmm. status, if I'm doing it for gain, where's God? And a lot right. of times 
God is lost in these moments. Uh, and, and that's another sign of, the, of, of a false prophet, I would believe. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, those are really helpful. The, um, I, all of those are angles to preach, you know. Um, and there's one really, though, um, puzzling thing, which is why God heals some people and not others. Mm. Yeah. So here he is healing um, a Syrian, a general, uh, and I have no answer for that. Catherine, you teach an entire course uh, just explaining exactly why that God is good to some people, right? Uh, yeah. So I co-teach a course called God, Evil, and Suffering which uh, with my friend Alan Padgett at Luther Seminary, which uh, was started by another couple of professors, Terry Freitheim and Paul Spoonham. Yeah, we talk about this, right? Why we talk, we have one week on miracles. It's actually my favorite week uh, of that course because, uh, first of all, we get to hear great stories from our students who have experienced miracles or their families. Or, and, you know, it just makes me realize that miracles still do happen. Uh, but also there's that, there is that vexing question, right? Why, why, are, why do some people receive miracles and others don't? And I think, you know, the best answer is just we don't know. Um, but also, and this I take this from uh, from my friend Alan Padgett, uh, he talks about that, that miracles are not cures, right? Miracles don't solve all the world's ills. That miracles are signs of yes. God's coming kingdom, right? God's reign and realm that is, that is breaking into our world, even now, uh, in, in these signs. Um, and, and of course, you know, in the Old Testament, some miracles like the plagues are, are which aren't, you know, positive miracles, but are, are called oaths or signs, right? So there's signs of God's power. There's signs of God's uh, inbreaking kingdom and presence. And so, you know, uh, Terry Fretheim, our, our dear departed uh, colleague, was fond of saying things uh, this, that you know, Jesus cured uh, lepers, but he didn't cure lep- he didn't get rid of leprosy, right? Or he he calmed the storm, but he didn't cease all storms. So even in Jesus' time, the miracles that he did, uh, you know, they're, they're signs. They're 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 meant to increase faith. They're meant to support faith. They're meant to give us glimpses of God's rule and reign uh, and of the inbreaking kingdom. But they're not meant to be. Uh, panacea or, a, you know, a cure-all for the ills of the world. So we don't know. We don't know why some are cured and some aren't. But uh, we know that God, uh, that, that, that these uh, healings that do happen, whether miraculous or whether through uh, human agency, uh, God using human agency, that these, these are meant to support our faith, meant to give us hope um, in, in God's really- power and presence. I really appreciate that, the acknowledgement that these are what I call glimpses of the glory of God uh, in breaking, uh, but not the fulfillment. Uh, We are still anticipating as we are in this point in uh, the Christian year where we are leading up to um, a season of Thanksgiving that will turn into the season of Advent, which is we look at as the celebration of the first uh, uh, presence of the Messiah, but it's actually an invitation to anticipate the return of Christ. And that is really leaning into all of these are reminders that God is, that God is great, that God is good, and that God is not yet done. Hmm. And that's why there is uh, this, um, um, the kingdom is not here in its fullness yet. And uh, I, I know that there are some um, New Testament passages where Jesus answers that question uh, because of your lack of faith. Um, and that's one way of looking at it. But I like the way that you've identified it because I think it is more to uh, help us to recognize this isn't about us getting what we want. This is about us increasing our faith in what God is doing. And it's a present act. And uh, that's hard for us. Um, that, that It's hard for us to live in the meantime, because the meantime are mean. Mm. 